Okay, guys, I'm just happy to be talking to Georgi and Anna, and you all have been at these protests almost every night. And just for all y'all who, who have not been following my work, I've been covering these protests in Georgia pretty much since they started. And so the protests have been going into their second week. And the more that uh, the government, um, you know, responds with violence, the more resilient the people get. And so for most, for y'all who don't know, Georgia Dream government has proposed this bill that will limit the roles of civil society organizations in Georgia and independent media. The main thing is that if you make more than 20% of your budget from from foreign funds, then the government says that we have a right to look at your books. Now, what's interesting about this bill, uh, I'm going to post it on the on, on the show notes. But the bill they published it in English, and honestly, it looks very ambiguous, and it looks like they can change the language at any time to make it mean what they want it to mean. And so, it's not even specific. It just gives them a lot of room to manipulate. And so I've read this bill and yeah, it's just so many problems. And so, um, Georgi and Anna, you both are here to like talk about your role in these protests and why you're there. And so Georgi, I just want to start with you, man. Like, welcome to Black Diplomats Podcast. I really want to, you all talk about why you're protesting this bill beyond what I said and why it's important for you to be out there every night and face this constant violence of rubber bullets and tear gas and these thugs on the street that attack you. Um, thank you so very much for taking your time and inviting us to speak on your podcast. It's it's a really, really great honor. Um, I'd like to begin uh, discussing uh, the subject, the protest within historical context. So the first things first, um, twenty percent of Georgia has been occupied by Russia, and ever since, for over two hundred years, Russia has been trying to undermine my country, and do various sorts of stuff uh, in order to increase its influence. And um, historically, we fought against Russia in multiple wars, and now this is just a new chapter by Russia to attack sovereign state and uh, have their hands in our legal system, in our government system. Now, the situation on the ground is fairly simple. Uh, this law would limit uh, a lot of democratic processes in our country, including uh, free media, including a non-governmental sector. And as you so, so well pointed out, it is articulated in a, such a vague and in a, such an unclear manner uh, that this law can take all kinds of shapes like we've seen in Russia because the similar law has been introduced in Russia, uh, Russia back in 2012. And we know that fast forward the 12 years, they and ended up banning some people from even being eligible to participate in election or being detained, being fined, and so on and so forth. Therefore, we believe that it's very important for us to make a stand here and say no to the Russian law in Georgia. That's <laughs> probably the best I can do with that. Yeah, Anna, what, okay, tell us about yourself, Anna, and uh, welcome. Hi, hi again. Um, again, I'm Anna, yeah. I'm Georgian, I'm 24, and that's just about as much as you need to know before I get into the conversation. Um, so I grew up in an era of unregulated internet. And so I had access to very, very many ideas from Europe, from America, from anywhere around the world. So I do believe that these very substantially contributed to who I am today. And I also do believe that most of the good that has come to our country has come through European Union, has come through America, who has come through various Eastern European countries who stood with us in 2008. And what Russia is trying to do, as it always has, is to cut off all this access that we have to different resources, to different knowledge, to different partners, as it always has. Like, the imperialistic Russia was against us, the Soviet Russia has 
basically messed us up. And right now, even you know, as a full fledged country, as a well, not entirely a Republican Federation, it is trying to at least, um, if not annex us completely, then take away our self sufficiency. And because the government has been run by an oligarch for the past like 12 years now, I think it's been, yeah, since 2012, um, Georgia is very weak in terms of like, it's very weak politically, it's very weak in foreign relations, it's very weak in self-defense, and we're just basically left with nothing against Russia, and right now this just feels like this last-ditch effort to take away what little independence we have. And so as somebody who's grown up with both Georgian values and as somebody who's been spending a lot of time, you know, getting acquainted with, let's say, the European way of life, different countries, different points of view, I do believe that if this law passes, it's just going to screw us over as a country, me as an individual, my family, everybody I know basically. So that is why I stand out there and I protest no matter what happens, because at this point, it's not, um, you can't choose a middle ground. It's either all or nothing. And considering the government has literally brought out thugs to like scare our people into obedience and they're calling people on their private numbers, basically telling them, we have your address, we're going to beat you up. That has started happening today. Um, I do think that it's all... Have you got enough messages? Not, not yet. Not quite yet. I'm not um, active enough in the political scene to matter to them yet, I think. But like a couple of people I know have gotten those messages. Um, some of the political parties and activists have gotten those. Ma- not, not necessarily messages. They're calls coming in from Ukrainian numbers, which is insane to me. And the fact that the government is stooping this low, like stooping to these level of pettiness in order to get what they want is just astounding to me. And there's just no way back. So, Georgi, they're firing rubber bullets and all these things at you. Um, How have you all been preparing to deal with the violence? Because the goal is to scare you from coming, but you still continue to come. I'm interested in what you've learned from dealing with these people on a day in and day out um basis um uh i would say there are quite a few things uh that we have a clear understanding of uh when it comes down to protesting against riot police uh the first thing i would say is that you need to have a face mask a gas mask that's going to protect you from the tear gas. You need to have uh, goggles over the over your eyes to make sure that your eyes are protected. You need to wear jeans or some tough material. So those are technical stuff. The other thing is um, those special special cops are wearing uh, heavy materials, and there is there are a lot more of us than them. So how long can they chase us while they're wearing like 25 kilograms on, on, on top of their body? So they get exhausted even more than we do because at the end of the day, we're just standing there and uh, with our friends and family members. So the fact that they are unable to use actual real guns And I firmly believe that Georgian military is not ever going to shoot Georgian people because Georgia's youth is of crucial importance to the military because they're designed to protect those youngsters. So shooting them down would not fly well, neither with Georgian people, neither with uh, general population uh, or the world because everybody's seeing what's going on everybody's understanding the situation and the pervasive russian influence in georgian government so as long as the army is not shooting us rubber bullets can only do so much right so that's the part where the courage comes in and the first couple of uh, lines of defense are simply people who are courageous enough 
to understand that it's better to get a rubber bullet today than poisoned and killed like, I don't know, any Russian opposition or social activist leader tomorrow. Or, or the same thing goes in Belarus for most part. So we do have a good understanding that it's okay to get hurt to smaller extent than get hurt a lot tomorrow. And everyone is bent together under the same banner of understanding this idea. So I guess there is no stopping that part, I guess. <laughs> Anna, what's going to happen if this bill goes through and becomes a law and the president, Salome said, you know, like she, she, you know, the, the Georgian president said that she will veto it, but then Georgia dream will still try to work around her to make it a law anyway. But if this bill what, through all of its processes passes and it's legal, what's the next plan? Um, Honestly, <laughs> We'll probably cross that bridge when we get there, but all we know is that there is no way we can allow this bill to remain in effect. Like, um, right now, again, we're trying our best to protest peacefully. We're not really bothering anybody except maybe the couple of drivers who are going to be in our late home um, because we have had to barricade the streets for a bit. But if this law passes, essentially, what this means is eventual... I wouldn't say death of a nation, but the subjugation of a nation. So if a push comes to show, there is probably nothing that we're not willing to do to get our country back. And like, we really need these people to leave. Like, we really need the Georgian dream to leave because they've made promises in the past and they haven't kept any of them. Matter of fact, like around a year ago, they tried to pass the same bill and... Even then, protests happened. The protests on the government side got violent because they started using tear gas. But then they halted the process. Even then, they were starting to wage the info wars because they were telling us, um, we understand that you misunderstood what this law means. So we're going to try to pass the bill again when you guys are more complacent. And surprise, surprise, we're not more complacent. <laughs> so, Georgi, um Tell me how old are you are, first of all. And then secondly, what's for you if the bill passes? Can you just describe how you feel the life will change and how people specifically will be impacted? So I'm 29. And to get to your uh, question, right? So uh, first things first, uh, they're going to limit uh, operations of free media and non-governmental sector. And when I'm talking about like non-governmental sector, right, they sometimes get bad reputations here and there. So let me provide some insight. Like USAID, for example, provides us uh, with funds to restore churches, to restore historical monuments. So all of that is going to deteriorate and it's going to deteriorate very quickly because Georgia is not very uh, rich. So cultural preservation is going to fly out of the window. Now, people with various types of disabilities who are receiving uh, some medical assistance through NGOs, people who are in uh, legal trouble with the government, and receive some legal consultation for free from NGOs, that's going to fly. Um, people who have their rights stripped away, and I'm talking about the most vulnerable people, pe victims of various crimes, such as women, women who are victims of sexual harassment and rape, who receive free legal consultation, that's going to fly out of the window. And people who generally concentrate on human rights issues that's also gonna go moreover it's it all to 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 basically wrap this up together right a significant lifeblood of georgia is happening through the medium of ngos because they receive funds from european union and from us canada and other countries alike in order to maintain some um form of like civil society they 
to help people and all of that is simply gonna go away if, if, if that law passes moreover there is going to be another side which is a political side so ngos are responsible for uh, observing the elections so they invite their associates from european union and us to help us observe the election now if you were to be a government and you wanted to fraud uh, the um, elections the best way you could do that is to make sure that no European or US observers visit Georgia during the election time. And you could conveniently do that by reducing the amount of NGOs that can operate and invite their associates and partners from Europe and US. So there is the first part is like the, the one that we're going to feel immediately but also more of a long-term kind of frustration. However, the second part, the elections that we are going to have in October 2024 are going to be frauded massively and if this law passes. Okay. Anna, um, I talk to a lot of people under 30 in Georgia, and the conversation is always about immigration and people who feel like, there's no future for them in Georgia or they feel so depressed because there are no other political options beyond Georgia dream. And they don't want to live in a country that is a satellite state for Russia. And so they say that if I can, if I'm in Georgia, I'm working hard every day. I'm going to university. I'm doing everything right, but nothing is coming in my favor. Then I will leave. And you have a lot of people who are doing that. I want to ask you about, you're 24 years old and what do you think about your country right now as a 24 year old Georgian woman and as somebody who, who is fighting for it, but you have so many more people, many people who are discouraged and they just leave. Well, um, to start off the situation overall sucks. Sure. It's not great. It's pretty bad. Um, our youngsters are, encouraged if not bullied by the government to seek shelter elsewhere but um i'm going to be pretty honest with you when the protests first started i was hopeless like i was on that same way where i was like if this doesn't work out i'm just out of here i'll find something i can find something right but um as the protests go on the one thing that has really kept me grounded is like our people and the way they handle stuff. At the protests, I have seen kindness from people I did not think humanly possible. Like, we have this thing about Georgia saying that we are historically a unified nation, meaning we overcame all of our invaders, and there were a bunch of those, honestly, by standing united. And all the time I thought, you know what, you know, that's some what some guy wrote down in our history books just so we feel better about ourselves? No. Um, there are always going to be sellouts. There are always going to be people who are trying to make your life in this country a little more difficult. But the people I have seen in this country give up their resources, give up their safety to help us is like enough to keep me here and keep me fighting for a better future. So um, again, the circumstances that have been forced upon us are unfortunate, but I do believe in our people. I do believe in what we're capable of if we stand together. And it's something I'm willing to fight for no matter where it takes. So that's my current take on things. Okay, good. Thanks. And so, you know, Georgi, uh, the Georgia Dream argues that this bill is no different than laws that are in the United States that are in other European countries that monitor foreign money coming in. And what, are your, what is your response to that? Well, first of all, I would probably trust U.S. and Europe's governments on that one over Russian oligarch. So with that out of the way, I would say uh, U.S. law, FARA, is based about... Is, is specifically designed for lobbyists who are lobbying some stuff and it is not designed for uh, NGOs and free media. I'm pretty sure if 
Biden or, or whatever government you're going to have, if they decided one day, hey, I'm going to check all the books for all the medias. And then if they receive some funding out from outside sources, they're get, getting closed or fined or labeled as foreign agents or spies, which is roughly correct translation of the gist of the word in Georgian, then I'm sure that a lot of Americans would come out with pitchforks and make sure that that doesn't happen. So uh, when it comes down to um, the only instance that this has ever um, came close to be in European Union, it was Hungary's, Viktor Orban's Hungary. And Guess what? European Union said no to that and they could not actually pass the law because Hungary is already part of the European Union and it was not consistent with European values. The only place where we have seen a law like this is in Putin's Russia and because that it was taken in effect in 2012, we have a really good understanding where this law might develop because it's 2024 now. And we've seen the law, we've seen the effects of the law, and the essence of this is that, <laughs> A, if you're not going to take uh, Blinken's word on it or your highest representatives of your government, you can take, you can at least be sure that the Russian ol oligarchs and the Russian government lies more than any other government or most of other governments combined. So that's a, that's a good reminder for, I, I know that you guys have a lot of internal like uh, clashes and whatnot, but that's a good reminder for an American people to, to like keep in back of their heads, like, yeah, your government might be lying, but like governments elsewhere are doing a piece of art when it comes down to lying and being deceitful and assholes in general. You know what's interesting? You talk about assholes. Like, I think I can't. Um, I've always tried to reach out to Georgia Dream for comment and ask them to come on my show. It happened one time, but what they did was that they gave me this one person to always talk to and I feel like they were trying to control their own narrative and that it just became a bit ridiculous and then I go to Georgia almost every year I live in Ukraine so I've been yeah I, I live in Ukraine so I cover the war there so I've, I've for these past couple years I haven't been to Georgia but you know, those guys don't talk to you, but then I realize how they treat these high level European and U S oppositions and they pretty much give them the middle finger. Then I, at first I'm like, damn, why are they not talking to me? But then they tell like Charles McHale to go fuck himself. Then I don't feel so bad because who am I compared to, you know, like these high level European union leaders and, and Anthony Blinken. So they tell them to go fuck themselves. And of course, they're going to tell Terrell Jermaine Star <laughs> of the Black Mess podcast to go fuck himself too. So, like, so, so right? Um, but, <laughs> but I mean, really, it, it's, it's true, right? But, but, you know, I want to ask you all about the opposition in Georgia because. Obviously, you either want this government to resign at minimum, you know, like def resign or just at minimum pull back this bill. But you have elections in October. And what do you think about the opposition? Anna, I'll just start with you. Oh, they're not ideal, honestly. But right now we don't have the time or like the mindset for ideal. Basically, what we're looking for right now is... Where the Georgian dream has also screwed us over is they promised to lower the barrier for elections at which a party would be able to um, enter the parliament. And then they didn't do that. So our main idea right now, at least mine, is to make sure that the parliament is essentially made out of multiple coalitions. We are not looking for any singular party to take the lead. And I understand that sounds chaotic. It always does. But um, that is the only option we have right now. 
And again, I think it's time that Georgian people stopped relying on one singular leader. So I think my thought process behind this is that if there are multiple coalitions, multiple parties with clashing views, even some that I don't agree with, um, when they have to like make up parts of the government and when they have to appoint, let's say, the general prosecutor or somebody who's the head of elections, they're going to have to compromise between each other. So then it's not going to be a singular party controlling every resource we have in the country because Georgian Dream controlling every resource in the country is what got us where we are. They have the entire lawmaking system. They have the entire like courts. They have the police. They have the administrative resources that they basically forced to come out in the country um, like, and protest for them. They literally take down lists of people who don't go. It's that bad. So my thinking behind this is that if we get rid of these these people and we actually have multi-parties, we have different people, again, it's not going to be ideal, but it is going to balance itself out a bit because when forming a government, somebody's going to have to compromise on this, somebody's going to have to compromise on that, and then we will not have a singular ruling um, party, so to say. Or at least that's the ideal route. I got you. Georgi, what are your thoughts about the opposition? Um, so the pattern is like we've seen it in Ukraine. We've seen it in Moldova. We, we, we've seen it multiple times, right? Uh, a pro-European government that has gone a bit overboard is replaced by Russian, pro-Russian government or an oligarch. And this is the situation now. I understand that there are some opposition parties that I particularly dislike, and there are some that are not that terrible. However, given the current electoral system, I think what's going to happen is that they're going to, some smaller opposition parties are going to create coalitions before the election, so they will get a, a list of people who are, most well-known, most proficient at what they're doing. And those people are going to get selected by various groups. Um, I genuinely hope that uh, the, essentially, if they, so let me provide some quick context, right? In 2020, uh, there is a thing in Georgia called parallel voting, right? And according to parallel voting, uh, Georgian Dream scored 44%. However, in actual voting, they did write 48%, which turned into them into not a simple majority, but a constitutional majority, right? So, um our goal, my personal goal is that uh, knowing fully well that uh, they're bribing people, they're scaring people, they're uh, compromising people with like various forms of uh, coercion, right, is happening right now. I know that it's going to be very difficult election because because of these factors, right? My goal is to make sure that they cannot get their hands on a constitutional majority. They cannot update our constitution uh, and our constitutional goals and aspirations are protected by members and peace from the opposition. And that is very possible and that is very easy given that if we detect signs of fraud, which we did back in 2020, and we screamed about it and we protested about it, that EU, our associates in European Union and in US, discarded that evidence and uh, still kind of agreed with Georgian dream power. I hope that it, this time around, they will use... Um, more detailed approach they do better research because the evidence for the fraud back in 2020 was overwhelming and unfortunately it didn't get enough attention it didn't get enough recognition both in us canada and uh, in european union countries and i believe that should solve the problem Technically, I think what's going to happen is once the majority is uh, 
full like ma majority of the people in parliament are from opposition parties and those are very different right there are like opposition parties that i desperately do not agree with but as soon as we have that i hope to see a second election being run which is going to be free and fair election and that's going to be the deciding factor uh to see how the georgian population votes without pressure coercion bribery and other kinds of excuse my french but all kinds of bullshit that's going on in current georgian situation yeah so and i'll get you know i'll get to the last part but basically i want to give some context to what you're saying so when you're talking about 2020 um georgi is talking about the parliamentary election of 2020 and so after that there was a local election right that happened in 2021 i know that because i was there to cover that and so the thresholds that georgi is talking about basically there was a point where you just needed one percent in order to enter parliament parliament now it's five and then another part of it is that there are no technically you can't form a block anymore like so there's a difference between coalition and then a block like a block is how you can like kind of gather up and like put all the votes together like you legally can't do that anymore just to give everyone the context of how it works and so it's just an example of how a lot of georgia dreams critics suggest that they're making the thresholds difficult in order to change their to challenge their power that's just a little bit of insight i'll put my own reporting in the show notes um from my own articles where i break all that stuff down because i spoke with the opposition and all that but anna um Really, I mean, it comes back to this voting. So, I, you know, with these protests, excuse me. Um, you all are fighting for the future of your country and the European Union um, members uh, have come out really strongly against Georgia Dream. And everything that I hear from my side here in the West is that the the yes, we can make put these strong statements out and yes, People are talking about sanctions, but ultimately they're waiting for the Georgian people to make decisions because what everyone thinks about here when they think about Georgian resistance is the Rose Revolution. And even though Saakashvili is his own person, we're not even going to talk about him because he's a different animal. What they did see, what it, vastly, that's a whole different can of worms, but, but basically, and he's currently, um, riding in a, um, jail cell you know for unfair reasons but again it's a whole nother story but basically they saw the georgian people take over in the revolution and so then the united states and, and the europeans could come in and say okay we will recognize this government that this peaceful revolution created and so now you're in a situation where good you are protesting i actually spoke with one person who said they actually don't want a revolution they actually want to be able to force the people to resign or vote them out like in uh you know like in, in in these legal processes and i just want to ask you what do you you know there are so many things that can happen anna um and again people are waiting for the georgian people to respond and what are your thoughts about everything i just said okay so um to kick this off honestly I do not think that we're looking for a revolution if there are other ways to get what we want. And um, to be slightly critical over here, I do believe that the European Union and the US have sometimes been a little slow in acknowledging the issues that were happening with Georgia previously from the 2008 war. So I understand they're looking for a revolution, but like we need sufficient support. There are only many there are only so many people that can come out screaming and protest every day right um and the pressure that the european union is currently exerting on the georgian dream is working i can say with confidence that it's working because i'm looking at these people come out every day and they're losing their shit like these government officials are officially off their rockers with the things that they're starting to do and things that they're like starting to say and try to press. And so I do think that we're currently exerting enough pressure on them to be able to force results without a revolution. Because again, like speaking of a revolution is always painful and scary. And, you know, it's something I think we'd rather not do, but we are absolutely prepared to do it. Because again, like, um, a very personal thing here, but I've got one life, 
right? And there is no point in trying to live this life subjugated by a different empire, like being stripped off of all my personal freedoms and the privileges. Well, I mean, in Georgia, there aren't that many, but there are some, right? So um, I would like to live this one life free and, well, more or less happy. And if I have to fight for it, if I have to get hurt for it, it's something that I'm willing to do. And I think that's the mindset of most of the people protesting out in the streets. Georgi, I'll give you the last word. Uh, I couldn't agree more to Anna's uh, little detour on on her personal feelings. Um, I firmly believe that uh, peace is one of the noblest aspirations, but in order to uh, sustain peace, you must be will, be willing to fight. And I'm willing to fight for my country and I'm willing to fight for the future of myself, my family members and friends. And I'm sure that they are willing to return the favor and stand by my side in, at times of need. So uh, that, that, those are my feelings towards the subject, and I think I, it can a lot of people can relate to that in terms of um, living without dignity, living without freedom, and living under the occupation by the uh, second grade discount uh, version of Lukashenko in Georgia would not be something that I want to do in my life. <laughs> And I would not want that for my younger siblings and and my other friends. <laughs> so that's that's where I start. All right, guys. So, all right, y'all. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We're going to continue to cover these protests and heard from people who are under the age of 30 about the future. And so you all gave us some really good perspectives into what you all see every day. So thank y'all, man. And I'll definitely be following and I'll be coming to the country uh, this year to see you all at work and so yeah thanks a lot thank you man it it really means whole ton that you have invited us and that you're taking interest you're showing all this information to our friends in usa and i'm, I'm sure that your reach is far, far more reaching than just locally <laughs> so i appreciate that and it it helps us get up out of the bed in the morning because we know that there are some good people (laughs) showing (laughs) our good fight to 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 people that are really important and really matter.